Sunday, 25th of July, 2004, just north of York, England. Two policemen emerge from the bushes beside a road, escorting a cuffed, dishevelled man, his expression stubborn and sardonic. There had been a nationwide manhunt declared to find this guy, and now the coppers had him, banged to rights. As he was led away to the waiting cop car, he muttered, I'm a murderer, aren't I? Today, descent into darkness examines someone despicably evil. The killing spree of Mark Hobson. Early Years Mark Richard Hobson was born on the 2nd of September 1969 in Wakefield, West Yorkshire, to parents Peter and Sandra. He also had two sisters, Melanie and Leslie. The family were very much a traditional Yorkshire working class. His father was a coal miner who had worked his way up to a manager at the nearby Park Hill Colliery. His mother was a machinist. A very comfortable dual income to the household, and by all accounts, a very happy and stable environment for the children growing up. Indeed, one of his old school teachers said of Mark Hobson, He was very well behaved, so average and ordinary that he was almost anonymous. The family would move to the town of Selby in North Yorkshire sometime around 1982, when the colliery closed, forcing his father to seek work at another pit. Thankfully, that area of the country at the time had pits everywhere. Mark finished his schooling at Brayton Secondary School in Selby, leaving at the standard age of 16 to enter the world of work. He was, for all that knew him, a pleasant enough young chap, yet things would take a dramatic turn once Hobson became free of the family home. Emerging Demons The first known instance where Mark Hobson displayed a highly troubling behaviour came when only three weeks into his first job at a butcher's shop. He had become annoyed with one of his co-workers and, in a fit of rage, had picked up a boning knife and threatened to stab the poor sod. Needless to say, once the situation had been calmed down, Mark was let go from the job. Five years later, in 1991, Mark moved into a house with his childhood sweetheart named Kay. She had with her two children from a previous relationship, and Mark had gladly taken on the responsibility of a father figure for them. A year later, the family was blessed with a daughter of their own. By this point, Mark had a very stable job at the nearby power station at Drax, and had a bit of a side hustle as a landscape gardener for a bit of extra beer money. In 1994, the couple were married. Kay would say of him that he was pretty much the perfect husband, working hard to provide for his family and showing love and care toward them. In every photograph of him, he shows off his beaming smile and looks for all the world like a genuinely happy bloke, winning at life. But behind the smile, something was not well. Seemingly out of the blue, he had begun drinking heavily and had taken to smoking cannabis, a dramatic change in habits. His drinking had caused him to leave his job at Drax and instead take up a job of a doorman at the Cannes nightclub in Selby Marketplace in 1998. Then, on New Year's Day of 1999, Hobson, without warning, walked out on the family that he had worked so hard for. Kay was completely taken aback by this sudden change in him, later remarking, There was no one else involved. He just didn't want married life anymore. It was bizarre. Couldn't believe it. He turned to pot and drinking heavily. He never drank when we were married, but now he got out of his face and he became like a zombie. His life just went completely off the rails. And off the rails, he certainly appeared to be going. In 2002, Hobson viciously attacked a man called William Brace outside an off-license, that's a liquor store for my American viewers, stabbing him five times with a Stanley knife. Brace had seen his ex-girlfriend walking with Hobson in Selby Town Centre and wanted to confront her. This is when the attack occurred. A wholly disproportionate reaction to such a situation. His erstwhile friend, a father of two, 
was left battling for his life and had to undergo emergency surgery to repair the damage, most notably a punctured lung. Yet, outrageously, Hobson was able to avoid prison by pleading guilty to the charge of wounding with intent to cause grievous bodily harm. His sentence? Two years of probation and a community service order of 100 hours. When I worked in probation, we had a fair number of people for the same sort of offence who were on indeterminate public protection sentences and had served at least 10 to 15 years. And yet Hobson got community service for knifing someone. And people wonder why the justice system is so very, very fucked. A year after this incident, though, he did seem to be showing some much-needed drastic improvement to his life. He had begun a new job as a refuse collector, more commonly known as a bin man, and he got a house on Millfield Drive in the small village of Campbellsforth, moving in with his new girlfriend, 27-year-old Claire Sanderson. Claire, though, had had a troubled past herself. Issues with anorexia and alcohol made her exceedingly vulnerable to a man like Mark Hobson. In one particular incident in 2003, he had been in the pub with Claire when an argument had broken out between them, which saw Mark drag her across the room and punch her repeatedly in the face. And this kind of public display of brutality was not a one-off. He did not care who was watching whenever he decided to assault Claire, and Lord only knows what continued on behind closed doors. Police were called on numerous occasions, but as is so often the case, she seemed unable to break the vicious cycle of abuse. And it is at this point, dear viewer, that I shall take you aside to remind you that if you or someone you know is the victim of ongoing domestic violence, please pick up the phone and contact your local law enforcement or a domestic abuse shelter. Regardless of gender, no one should have to suffer, and they, or you, cannot afford to wait. Do it now, and get them or yourself the help needed. As if this wasn't enough, Hobson began to develop an unhealthy obsession with Claire's twin sister, Diane. He even admitted as much to one of his colleagues, saying that he had chosen the wrong sister. This obsession had bubbled away, until, one night, he wrote a to-do list, where he outlined exactly what it was that he needed to do to get rid of Claire and finally have Diane. But this list was far more sinister than simply ending a relationship. He had written about buying bin liners, cable ties, fly spray, and disinfectant. Hobson was planning something truly despicable. On the 11th of July 2004, Mark and Claire had had a couple of drinks in the local pub in their village, the Commerce Inn. This would prove to be the last time that Claire Sanderson was ever seen alive. The Killing Spree When the couple returned home, Obson began to enact his elaborate plan. He frenziedly struck Claire on the head with a hammer a total of 17 times. He further made certain that she was dead by strangling her. He wrapped the body in bin bags and dumped her in the bedroom of their home, leaving it there for nearly an entire week during the summer months, seemingly not caring about the extremely unpleasant sights and smells of a decomposing body right there in the house. He then turned his attention to Diane. Up until now, Hobson had been keeping up pretenses of normality and making excuses as to why Claire had not been seen around. In the meantime, he had begun reading up on survival techniques, in the clear realisation that he would soon have to go on the run from the police once his deeds became known. Six days after Claire's murder, he phoned Diane and said that Claire had been ill with glandular fever, and that she had said that she really wanted to see her sister. Diane, being the ever-loving sister, made straight for the house, but in doing so, she had unknowingly sealed her fate as well. And this time, Hobson would let his sadistic side have full reign. Once she was in the house, Hobson began his attack on Diane. He wrestled her to the ground and tied her up. Once she was secured, he began torturing her, cutting her with razor blades and stabbing her with a pair of scissors. He also cut and stabbed at her genitalia and bit off her left nipple. This was not found by investigators afterwards, so it has been presumed that he swallowed it. Then, just like her sister, he hit her repeatedly with the same hammer and strangled her. 
once again wrapping her body in bin bags and dumping her next to the corpse of her beloved twin. Later that day, Diane's boyfriend, Ian Harrison, an old mate of Hobson's, phoned Diane's mobile to find out where she was as they were supposed to be meeting up after she had seen her sister. Hobson had answered and invented a story that both sisters had received news that their dad, George, had taken a heart attack and they had rushed to the hospital. Ian, suitably duped, arranged to meet up for a pint that evening with Hobson. Later, Ian would say that when he saw him in the pub, he seemed calm and perfectly normal, not suspecting that anything was amiss whatsoever, and yet he had murdered two women, both of whom were lying in his bedroom, cold and calculating and extremists. Astoundingly, Hobson even invited Harrison back to his place for more drinks. When they got there, Ian remarked on the awful smell in the house, but Hobson had lied and blamed it on the drains. When Harrison saw the bloodstain on the sofa, he told him that it was Claire and her woman's problems. Classy. Ian Harrison went home to bed, but by the next day, with still no word from Diane, he decided to go around to her house. His blood ran cold when the door was answered by her dad, who looked the very picture of health. When George had, no doubt, asked why Ian had looked like he'd just seen a ghost, Ian had told him the yarn that Hobson had spun. The two suspicions sufficiently aroused, they both decided to go round to Hobson's gaff and demand answers. They found he wasn't in, and so decided to break in. As soon as they walked into the bedroom, they both found the horrific sight. Both of poor George's daughters laying there on the floor wrapped in plastic bin bags, I cannot even begin to imagine the devastation in his mind at that moment. When the police arrived, they almost instantly found Hobson's macabre to-do list, and which left little doubt as to the premeditated nature of the crimes. Beside his entry about luring Diane to the house, he had scrawled, Use and abuse. That very same day, Hobson committed his next murders. He had phoned his mum, Sandra, and had asked for a lift to York Hospital. This time, his lie was that both Claire and Diane had been in a car accident. Sandra, of course, believed him and was only too happy to help. When they arrived at York Hospital, Hobson had gone in while Sandra waited in the car park. Very shortly afterwards, he came back out and said that the sisters were in serious condition and that he was going to stay there for a while until they recovered. Sandra wished the girls a speedy recovery and left him there. The lie had worked like a charm. When his mother was out of sight, Hobson left the hospital grounds and headed northeast out of the city, ending up in the village of Strensel, six miles away. There, sometime between 0900 and 1100, he broke into the house of James and Joan Britton, an elderly couple aged 80 and 81 respectively. Both were exceedingly frail, and James suffered from a condition similar to Parkinson's and was nearly deaf. This sweet old couple were no match for the violence of Mark Hobson. He savagely beat them both with their own walking sticks and then stabbed them. Joan was stabbed so violently that the blade stuck in the floor beneath her and the handle of the knife snapped off. Hobson then turned the place upside down, presumably looking for money, and then fled. At 11.15, a neighbour came round to check on the Britons, and found the horrific scene. My cousin, who wishes to remain anonymous, served with North Yorkshire Police at the time of this case, and he attended the scene of the Britons' murder. Manhunt and Arrest With these two new murders, Mark Hobson had just become Britain's most wanted man. His ugly mug was plastered everywhere around the North Yorkshire area. Anyone with any information was encouraged to come forward. In the meantime, Hobson had gone to ground in some fields just north of York, near the village of Shipton by Benningborough. But despite reading up on survival techniques, he clearly was not cut out for it. He had run out of water and sig papers, because priorities. He decided to walk into a petrol station on the main road to get some supplies. Due to the extensive coverage of the story on the news of the publicity campaign, the staff instantly recognised him and discreetly phoned the boys in blue. 
In another point that my cousin raised, at the very moment when Hobson was entering the petrol station, he was just pulling away from it in his car. If he'd have been delayed just another 30 seconds while paying, he would have no doubt spotted Hobson and claimed the collar for himself. So near, yet so far. Armed police quickly descended on the area, and it didn't take them long to find their man, a short distance away. He was arrested and led away by two cops, one on each arm. As they frog-marched him to the waiting panda car, Hobson apparently said to them, I'm a fucking murderer, aren't I? In Leeds Crown Court, he pleaded guilty to all four murders, and the sentence was a foregone conclusion. They had his fingerprints all over the bin bags used to wrap Claire and Diane's body, and he had left them all over the Britain's house when he ransacked it. Mr Justice Greekson said in his remarks, The damage you have done is incalculable. You have not only destroyed the lives of your victims, but you have devastated the lives of those who loved them. It should come as little shock that Hobson didn't seem to show any emotion at this condemnation of his character was read out. Mark Hobson was sentenced to life imprisonment. A whole life tariff was imposed by the then Home Secretary, meaning that he will die in prison. On the inside Whilst awaiting trial, Hobson was placed in solitary confinement after he attacked another prisoner, Ian Huntley, who had gained infamy when he murdered two schoolgirls, Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman, in the town of Sewham in Cambridgeshire in 2002, a certain topic for a future video. Hobson had scolded Huntley by throwing a bucket of boiling water at him. In various letters he had written, Hobson has claimed that the drugs and alcohol were responsible for his killing spree, but... I am sure that this is purely an attempt to shift the blame and paint himself as a victim to help his appeal. And appeal he did, on the rather ridiculous grounds that he felt that he should have been given more leeway by admitting to the crimes at the earliest opportunity and had not put the families through the harrowing ordeal of a trial. I'm sure they were so grateful. The appeal was rejected. At the time of writing of June 2023, Mark Hobson is now aged 53 years old and is being held at HMP Wakefield, a Category A prison, which is the highest security status in Britain, and has, over the years, hosted many other notorious inmates, such as Charles Bronson and disgraced former Lost Prophet singer Ian Watkins, leading to HMP Wakefield gaining the nickname the Monster Mansion, a highly fitting moniker. Legacy. The story of Mark Hobson presents a very strange phenomenon. Most of the time when we think about murderers, we expect to see major red flags emerging very early in childhood. Yet in his case, we see nothing that would make us suspicious of an impending problematic mind. No abuse, no trauma no significant moments that one could pinpoint as the catalyst for making a murderer. Yet his actions as a young adult seem to suggest that something was bubbling below the surface. He became an insidious narcissist who felt the need to possess the women in his life, that they should be at his beck and call for his every desire, and when he couldn't have them, he turned violent. Violence was clearly a theme in the immediate years leading to the eventual spree and subsequent arrest. His previous convictions leave little doubt about that. Something in him was triggered by those who dared to defy or displease him. But the most pertinent questions, I feel, is, was the outcome of Mark Hobson's life preordained? Or was it truly the drugs and alcohol that stirred up whatever was inside him, that may have lay dormant otherwise. As one who used to work with ex-offenders with personality disorders, I can't help but express a strange curiosity towards Hobson's mind. Certainly, I would have loved to have read an official psych report on him. But of course, the one thing that we can all be glad about is that he will never be released, and is now forced to spend every day of his remaining years caged. Now, he is the one who must follow instructions or risk punishment. The tables have truly turned on him.
when Mark Hobson's time is up on this earth, justice will finally be done for the four lives he took and the families he irreparably scarred. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative and interesting. If you did, please hit the like button and perhaps Lady Luck will smile on me and push this video out to more and more people. Check out my back catalogue to find more great videos just like this. What do you think of Mark Hobson and this whole case? Let me know in the comments below and I will endeavour to reply to as many of you as I can. If you wish to do so, you can support DID on Patreon, link in the description, or via the Super Thanks button if you wish to give a one-off donation. Or you can swing by the merch store on Teespring and grab yourself some swag. And if you can't get enough of the notorious DID, head on over to my alternate channel DID Reads, where I post renditions of famous poems, speeches, short stories, etc. And if you are a fan of the game World of Warships, you might well see me hanging out on there under the name The Dreaded Rear Admiral. Or if you prefer a first-person shooter, I can also be found occasionally getting my ass handed to me on Hell Let Loose under the name DID86. And in the meantime, take care of yourselves, and I shall see you on our next descent into darkness.